we grew up, I did, in the Roaring Twenties, had a good time, then all of a sudden, 29, 30, the Depression hit. That was a real experience for us. Uh, we didn't, have, at that time then, I had to go to work at 12 years old, and I worked ever since then, <laughs> until I retired. But uh, I had to work and help support the family and based on kind of taking care of myself and buying my own clothes and so forth. And so I went all the way through and I worked all the way through high school and so forth. Uh, besides going to school, I, you know, I was worked uh, my last in high school, I was working in this theater as an usher, worked up to the head usher and so forth and graduated. And uh, so, as I told you, after graduating from high school, I was able to work and uh, do some work and making some pretty good money, which was unusual. I was working at 10 hours a day, six days a week, making 50 cents an hour, so no time to spend it. So I had it pretty good. And then we came up with a three-year draft deal, and I didn't want to get in the draft. This is before the war. And I asked the company if they could keep me out of the draft. They said, well, you're 19 years old. We're not too sure. I said, well, if you can't keep me out, I'm going to go to college. So I went to University of Michigan. My tuition was $70 to go to college there. And I got into the University of Michigan. And uh, I was a sophomore. And uh, I was living in Doc Westinger's house. And one of the graduates who was graduating that year, he said, Ted, I'm going down to take the Air Force exam. Why don't you come down with me and take it? So we went down to Detroit, took the exam. He flunked it, I passed it. <laughs> I Unfortunately though, I, even though I passed the mental part of it, I'm colorblind. And I wanted this for a pilot now, and of course you couldn't be a pilot and be colorblind, so uh, I said, oh gee, that was bad. And so I went back to school and then uh, I still wanted to try to get in the Air Force, so I lived right across from Canada and he's right there. So I started to go over to Canada and join the Royal Canadian Air Force, thinking maybe I'd get in there and be a flying sergeant. Too many were doing that. So the government said, if you go over there, you lose your citizenship. So I didn't want to lose that, which was a blessing because all those guys got killed, you know, early in the war, yeah, fighting for Britain. And uh, so then uh, I uh, tried to get the merchant marines, merchant, because they were sinking so many ships, good money at it. I go to the merchant marines, but the merchant marines wouldn't take colorblind either. So I'm getting kind of upset about this whole thing. And uh, then Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. You can't believe the change because we were very socialist. We did not want to have anything to do with that war. We didn't mind supplying all the stuff and doing all that. But the war changed everybody, even like the, all the kids that were still in college, they were volunteering and so forth, you get the Air Force. and and the Marines and the Navy, and uh, so uh, I didn't. So the draft, they started the draft. I had a kid brother 18 months younger than me, and he's just getting out of high school, and he was ready to go to there, and I still hadn't been called up. And uh, they said if he hadn't been called up when you're, you can imagine the confusion when we first started in this. So I went down, as they said, report to your draft board, and see what happened, and sure enough, they'd lost my records. And so next week, congratulations, I was inducted into the service. And uh, I went from there then to, uh, to uh, Battle Creek, Michigan, and got my exams and all that, find out what I'd be in, got on a train, shipped us all around the country, don't know where we're going. I'm looking out the window, find out what state I'm in, you know, where I ended up in Clearwater, Florida. And I said, what am I in? You're in the Army, <laughs> Air Corps. <laughs> and, uh, the terrific deal there for kids. I had a, the worst place I could have been. We were in the jungles living in tents. Went through a hurricane, I, snakes and all the bugs. Had one dying every night almost in there. It was so bad because of the living conditions. Uh, you can't believe how horrible it was. Best thing that happened to me because everything after that was wonderful. So uh, the people that were in the, down there in Clearwater living in the, in the hotels, all the hotels were filled with so, that came into our base, went to Gulfport for a mechanical airplane. All these guys come to the hotel just bitching like mad. <laughs> we thought it was wonderful, nice hot bed, or showers and beds and all that. Just a matter of what the experience is and so forth. How was the, the flight training and, and then how did you get it selected for heavies? Well, you know, I told you I was in airplane mechanic school for just to be a ground crew and uh, they came through and said, we need fighter pilots and we would over, so go over to Bloxy, which is the next phase to us. So I went over to Bloxy, went through the tests and so forth. And when I come out, they said, well, you're colorblind, you know, 
So go on back. So I went back to mechanic school and so a little later on they were still looking for pilots to ask again. So I went over there again. I probably shouldn't have, but went through the whole same thing. And when I came, I said, don't come back. <laughs> you know, like you're colorblind. So a little later they asked, they needed gunners. So they were calling for gunners. So I went over again and went through the same thing. This time, I, what I should have done the first time, when I came out and the captain says, oh, you can't, you're colorblind. I says, this is ridiculous. I'm an architectural student. I paint one color to the other and everything. I said, I don't see what the problem is. So he reached down the drawer and he brought out the old yarn test. Asked me to pick out yarns, what color. I said, hell, you're okay, man. <laughs> Stab me for flying, Dad. Should have, or I could have probably gotten to be a pilot if I had done that the first time. So then I next went to gunnery school. So went to gunnery. And now I must remember, most kids came out of high school, never seen a gun, didn't have a gun in their hand. I'd been shooting since I'd been 12 years old. I did very great. So I was number one in my gunnery class, top gunner. <laughs> and uh, I've, even in that, they wanted me to be a gunnery strong, get to that later. But anyhow, so I went to gunnery school and then I went to Alexandria, Louisiana. B-17s, and so we formed our crew there, 10-man crew, and we trained there, start flying. But now we're not flying high altitude. We're flying low altitude, 10,000 feet, 12,000 feet. We're flying from Alexandria to West Texas, and there was a bomb site out there. We'd drop our bomb, and I, my job was to take K-13 in the radio room. We'd drop the 100-pound bomb. It's just for a little light down there when it hits, and I'd get in the radio room and start the K-13 and count off when it was going to hit, and then start the camera, take the pictures. Then we would fly back to Alexandria and we'd do all this. Then we'd go to the gunnery ranges and shoot for a while, you know, but- um, uh, What was that training on the, on the 50 cals? I mean, how bad was the recoil? Give me some text. There's no, no recoil, basically no re not much. Re Number one, we trained in turrets. I was also a Sperry turret and a Benz, the electric turret and the hydraulic. I was an expert in those really learned how what they were, how they operated and so forth. So it was and, like on the G model? Yeah, oh, and I love, and to me that was, a, every time I could fly in the turret, I'd get in the turret in our practice stuff. It's the most wonderful thing be underneath that plane, and all you can't see, you gotta really turn the guns up to see the bottom of the plane and so on. And you get everything and you're following. And I used to track cars and practice shooting at them and cars or whatever it was. And you're in the ball turret? In the ball, oh, the ball turret, yeah. And it's only five foot four inches outside diameter. 250 caliber guns in there. You can't, and your ammunition and your oxygen, you can't get anything else. And it is the most tight fit in that, but I love to fly that. And you're and, tall, how did you? No, no, I'm not tall, I'm only 5'8", but, uh, but you're, and you have to understand, I almost get in the position to show you how we flew, because you're so cramped up, you know, and you're cramped in, your hands are on the two gun controls up top, triggers are on the top, of that. Foot here controls the sight pedal that's down here. You're looking at that. To charge the guns, you can't charge the right gun with your right. You have to cross the charge. They're so tight in there. And, uh, yeah, I've seen that. I've photographed the ball turret on the bell. Yeah. And I'm just looking at how oh, and, and, and people there. And people can't realize how fast that, <coughs> that turret moves. 360 degree, it whips around. I know it doesn't go around. Yeah, I mean, you can whip it or you can just creep it. That's because you're following whatever it is. And 180 the same way. And uh, when you're in the turret, you got a door on the back that you climb in when you're inside the turret. But now when you're in the turret, that door's outside. If it flies off, you're, you got, you're just facing the wind. <laughs> okay. Because yeah, a lot of people think, oh, they're in the ball turret the whole time. Not necessarily. You would get in it, you know, before you, you know, you're flying oh, over the Well, internet. the ball turret gunners, when we take off, it's in a position and the door is available inside the plane. So he climbs into that, gets in, closes the door, now he can rotate and he gets so where that door's outside or you know, partially, wherever he's at, and he controls that. But he's up every few minutes or every 15 minutes, especially once we got the heated suit. Every few 15 minutes, he rolls the guns down, he opens the door and I used to hand him a can, he'd pee in it. <laughs> Hand it back to me, it's already ice. Just throw it on the floor. <laughs> you know? People don't know how cold it is. 30 to 70, well the coldest we had was 70 degree below, but it's 30 degrees or lower than that. You can't touch anything because they, we learned you know, from the early ones with the frostbite that uh, they froze to the guns or whatever they touched because you get moisture, you immediately froze to it. 
And uh, so they, what we had the benefit was silk glove. First glove I put on was a silk glove because if I had a charger and do any work or tr kick the bombs out or arm the bombs, I had, I could take the gloves off and so forth. But anyway. Did you do uh, different positions as your main role of gunner? I, I was the flight engineer and so I, it could be the flight engineer. I could, uh, not, couldn't be the radio operator or the bombardier or the navigator, but I could handle the ball turret, the upper turret, or I could do the waist guns. And I never went to the tail gun. I, I knew where he was, but that's a long crawl back there. And, but we had a tail gunner, and it wasn't bad. But the safest plane, and actually, for record show was the ball turret. And uh, Chet got flack in it a couple of times, but never got wounded. It bounced around in the turret and so forth. But he had it a couple times like that. I had a lot of close claws. I won't. I could get into you later on having an 88 go close, blow up right where this stand is next to me. Now you can imagine having a shell going off that close, like a hand. It's bigger than a hand grenade by far, you know. It's a cannon shell. And when I came to, I was laying across the gun and I was unconscious. And I said, "Oh God, how badly am I hurt?" I'm so numb, I don't know, you know. I figure maybe I have a leg off or something, you know, you don't know what, you know. And uh, I didn't have a scratch. Planes, the other one, so we took three of them. One went through the horizontal stabilizer on the run, punched a nice hole, took our top of our tank or our tail off. And the other one went off between Tacosta and the tail gunner and myself, wiped off both. He sits between 250 caliber box ammunition and wiped them both. <laughs> From him, and he only had his suit torn a little bit. <laughs> but you know, it's you know, and sit there and watch the stream of light go by, and there went a piece of flak right by, and there goes another one. You know, hits maybe hit my armor, or hit the gun, or hit me. You know, on the armor. And uh, what was the time period you were uh, in combat over there? Like I flew 37 missions. What was the the years? Uh, 19, the, beginning of 1944 to about uh, end of November or November and came back to the States. Because I was back for Christmas of uh, 44, yeah. That'd be special. Now that's, I had a lot of war to go on to. We were just taking Paris when I finished. My last mission was one of the bad ones where we went in, we were the very last bomb group going in and we were the very last ones trailing our bombs in, through the woods north of Paris. Uh, because there was supposed to be a real heavy German armament and soldiers down there, so we had several groups had gone through trailing their bombs through that area, and then we were the last one, so we trailed it through there, and when we got there, we made our 180 coming back, and now that's my last mission. You may, the feeling, you know, all this stuff, and I turned around, looked out the right window, and here comes all the C-46s and 47s going the other way. I watched probably a thousand paratroopers drop. Oh, most beautiful sight you wanted these go out, boom, 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 coming out of those planes, you know, just loading it. And uh, we went down and buzzed Paris, and I tore up a parachute for silk scars, and uh, you know, hey, we're all home, I'm going home. You can't, can't tell you the feeling and so forth on that, and uh, the plane's name was Take Me Home. <laughs> The base you were stationed at Kim Bolton, that uh, was at, at near Cambridge and so forth at 379th, and we were the best bomb group in the whole group of all the records they kept. We were number one in every item. Oh, well, and you were at Kim Bolton. At Kim Bolton, and we had two sub, uh, presidential citations. Besides, I have the Distinguished Flying Cross, three Air Medals, and other stuff you know that I got. But uh, <laughs> those are medals, you know. <laughs> when when they made the invasion. We were stuck on Cherbourg. We couldn't break out the soldiers, so they called the Air Force in, and we went at a low altitude, you know, seven, eight thousand feet, and uh, we were the very first group in, and we were on the very northern end of it. So we were coming there, and when we got to the front lines, the soldiers of the front line put smoke signals up. Then a thousand yards after that, we start trailing our bombs through the hedgerows and everything else, and the, where the Germans were. And then the next group would do the same thing, was gonna go all the way across Cherbourg like that. And uh, we, we made our run, did our dad, got shot up and so forth, and uh, we were on our way back home and they scrubbed the mission. And what happened was General McNair up in the front, his command post, the smoke drifted back at an A-20s and 26, knocked them out, killed them all. And so they scrubbed the mission, all the other called back, never gave us credit for it. We made the run, <laughs> and we didn't get credit for it. I had another one that we didn't get credit for, so I flew 37 missions. 
oh, they understand. They went through it. I don't think we can ever transport like the, you know we're doing here. They said, what do you think of the movie? I said, I don't think you can ever really pass on what we felt, what we went through. We can show them, but I don't think, it's like my last vision. I don't think you can ever get that feeling. You know, it's, it's so wonderful. You know, you can't understand with the joy, with all your body. It's, you just, there's hardly very few things you can do in your life to feel that way. And uh, so it's hard to transport that even with movies and everything else to them, so.